today we're talking about China, a country that's currently tightening its one belt, one road. It appears that with hundreds of billions of dollars in outstanding loans to struggling countries, they might soon be in the red China. We're talking about more than half a trillion dollars to dozens of countries, all calling in at once and saying, yeah, we don't currently have money. Now you might be thinking, wow, that really stinks for China. But let me tell you, China has quite the collection agency. If you thought the terms on payday loans were tough, you should see what these countries had to put up as collateral to get this money. The worry today is, should China foreclose on these loans, they would be taking over strategic assets in countries that now can't afford to feed their people. We may soon be hearing the sound of debt traps snapping across the globe, as African, Asian, Eastern European, and South American countries all fail to make loan payments. Now, To understand what's at stake today, let's start by looking at Sri Lanka. China takes control of a Sri Lankan port on one of the world's busiest shipping routes. Now, both countries are calling it a win-win. Sri Lanka, struggling to pay its debts, has signed a huge port deal with China, which will give it a foothold in the busy sea lanes between Asia and Europe. Yeah, it's a win-win. You keep both your kneecaps and we get your port. The deal raised roughly $1 billion in debt for the port project. Sri Lanka is now in more debt to China than ever as other loans have continued and rates remain much higher than from other international lenders. I gotta say, it's a breath of fresh air to finally have some good diversity in the imperialist nations category. As a white guy, it feels good to finally be able to say, you can't pin this one on us. Now, to start this conversation, we need to break down what government debt we're talking about. Because for regular viewers, when you think of debt, you're probably thinking of the treasury issuing treasury bills. This is not the case here. It's more like applying for a credit card. If you got a lot of money and a good credit score, you can get a low interest loan for a lot of money. If you've defaulted a few times, aren't making a ton of money, and seem like you're not going to be able to pay your bonds when they expire, well, then you're going to have to enter the murky world of international financiers, payday loans for countries. These groups include the IMF, World Bank, and recently the China Export Import Bank. Now, unlike the bond system, this means that you, as a country, owe money directly to an institution. China's loans differ from most other loans to developing countries by rich nations or by institutions like the World Bank because they tend to carry higher interest rates and shorter maturities, requiring refinancing every couple years. And they frequently use national assets as collateral. If that all sounds worse in literally every way, you aren't crazy. China's the one you go to when everybody else rejects your application. If you ask China, those features gave Chinese state-controlled banks the confidence to lend to poor and riskier countries. Have you had your loan application rejected by every major international financial institution? Is your credit so bad, people steal your identity and then give it back? Do you have an expensive infrastructure project of questionable profitability? Well then come on down to Xi Jinping's financing barn. At Xi's Financing Barn, we understand that sometimes you're more likely to get paid back by the Nigerian prince emailing you than the country of Nigeria. Everyone's pre-approved for a short-term high-interest loan with no questions asked. All you have to do is sign this form saying that you'll hand over your land or assets if you fail to make payments. Is that too bad to be true? No, that's really what we're offering. But you're desperate, and that railroad isn't going to build itself. Just look at our many satisfied customers from across the globe. Don't try to contact any of them though because they're pretty angry with us right now. Remember, at She's Financing, we'll lend you a hand. It'll just cost you an arm and a leg. Back to today, because what do you know? All those risky countries are defaulting on their loans at once. What's going to happen? Well, we're going to have to see as the negotiations proceed over the coming weeks, but there are some interesting dynamics to this debate that could determine the fate of a large portion of the developing world. 
On a hopeful note for the developing world, these China loans were negotiated bilaterally, giving China a ton of power. You know, it's a little hard for Ethiopia to go toe to toe with China. But then, with all of them failing at the exact same time, debt negotiations could turn multilateral if China doesn't play their cards right. It appears Beijing underestimated the risk that severe credit problems might affect all developing countries at the same time. China still insists on dealing with its debtor countries individually, though. But leaders in those places are increasingly calling for global, broad efforts to help with their problems. Who could have guessed that collective bargaining would lead to the downfall of China? Oh no, have we become bourgeois? Still, just because countries are holding hands and singing kumbaya doesn't mean they're going to succeed. You had a contract. The leverageable threat against China here is just how much of a PR nightmare this would all be. Xi was anticipating these loans would fail slowly over time, one by one, so acquisitions would linger on the third page. But seizing major assets from dozens of countries all over the world at once, well, that's going to not look great on a global stage where China's brand is already suffering. They're barely edging out Corona Especial for biggest brand losers of this crisis. Now, that's the main defense debtor nations have, though. If we all join together, we might be able to get top billing over what Trump tweeted in any newspaper anywhere. Now, while this might sound like it might not hold very much water at the negotiating table, China seems to be pursuing a policy of splitting up these debtor nations and negotiating a settlement with the most important ones. According to the Director of International Economics at the Council of Foreign Relations, Ben Steele, sounds reputable. China wants to keep Belt and Road countries divided, as they are stronger than each country individually. We haven't seen many agreements yet, but Kyrgyzstan just got a loan extension, so that's a good start. Unfortunately, the underlying terms of the renegotiated deal are a secret, so shot in the dark, I'm guessing that China came out above Kyrgyzstan in those negotiations. Similarly, the China Development Bank just widened a credit line by $700 million to help Sri Lanka cope, lowered the interest rate, and delayed the repayment timeline by two years. You already sold us your port for a billion dollars off your debt. Why don't you let us lend you $700 million to help you pay off the rest? <gasps> oh no, you're stuck in a well? Well, here's a shovel. The lowered interest rate and longer window should be helpful. But again, the terms of this deal are a secret. Beyond those two announcements though, we haven't heard much, and everyone from Ecuador and their half-finished debt finance dam to Djibouti, where debts to China dumped more than 80% of its annual economic output, and America's competing with China for military base payments as we're speaking, are watching these negotiations. At the end of the day, when you look at the breadth and scope of the countries that may default, it could be a very high risk for China. Will they take an inevitable write down on some of these debts, or will they be willing to seize countries' assets during such a sensitive time? Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. If you found this episode interesting, one of my favorite authors just wrote a book that might be right up your alley for this quarantine. John Perkins' new book, Touching the Jaguar, details his experience becoming an economic hitman, convincing developing countries to build huge infrastructure projects that put them in debt to the World Bank and other US-controlled institutions. Sound familiar? Here's what these backroom deals look like during America's heyday of exploiting this debt strategy, and the lessons we can learn from that to improve ethics and sustainable development in the future, in order to avoid continuing to circle the drain of this exploitation-based economy. As he would say, turning the failing death economy into a renewable life economy. Link in the description if that sounds interesting. Hello YouTube. First, I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. It's right below the John Perkins book. Also, remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring.
give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. And lastly, as always, thank you for watching.